The Open Door Baptist Podcast features the insightful preaching and teaching of our senior pastor, Jason Murphy. It also comprises of special messages from a number of guest speakers throughout the year. The purpose of this podcast is to be a witness in our community, to encourage others to grow in their relationship with God through the preaching and teaching of His Word, and to serve others in the name of Jesus Christ. I'd like you to take your Bible, please. Go to Psalm 68, Psalm 68, and also, if you would, Genesis chapter 2. Psalm 68 and Genesis chapter number 2. As you're turning there, I just want to mention a couple things here briefly. Let me ask this question as you're turning there. Uh, How many of you today um, are... Uh, you're not a member of Open Door. You're not, this is not a trick question. You're not a member of Open Door, but you're an attender. You've been coming for a little while. You're an attender. Hold your hand up if, if you would, okay? One and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight and nine and ten, uh, eleven. Okay, I think there was nine in the nine in the nine forty-five service. Just been attending for a while. Let me let me let me challenge you if I could. In five weeks from now, we're going to have our our membership class. And I encourage you to put it on your calendar. March 29th is the date. And plan on being there, if you would, just to kind of find out a little bit more about myself, about our church, what we believe. And I I think that every, every Christian without a church is kind of like an orphan. Keep in mind, God instituted the local church and it's will, it's his God's will that we all be a part of one. And so sign up for that. You can fill out the insert in your bulletin, fill out a response card. You can hand this to me or just plan on attending, but let us know. Child care is provided, dinner is provided. And uh, so please keep that in mind. That's on March 29th. Um, I want to say something about our 945 service. Our 945 service, we had a great service here at 945 today. I think they're kind of pushing the 1115 crowd and uh, just a full house. And I was encouraged, good spirit, good response, and just encouraged to see that. And uh, what a blessing. I also want to say it's good to see uh, Jim and Kathy Seaman with us today. Brother Seaman, good to see you here. Praying for you. Love you. Glad you're here today. And looking forward to what the Lord has for us from his word. Psalm 68, notice if you would, just one verse and then we'll have a word of prayer. Verse number 11. Psalm 68, verse number 11. The Bible says, the Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. Let's read that verse together. And if you don't have a Bible, I encourage you to use the one in the pew in front of you. I will say this, we're going to look at more scriptures this morning than we normally do on a Sunday morning. I have more passages than I do normally do. It just is what it is. And so I think you ought to have one ready if you can to use it as we look into the Bible today. Say that verse with me if you would. Psalm 68, verse number 11. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this uh, brief time we have this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we have a copy of it today, that you preserved it for us so we can know you. And I pray today that you'll use this message to challenge your people, encourage them, and, and Lord, implore them through your Holy Spirit to step out by faith and use the gift that you've given them and that they may yield their members as instruments of righteousness and be a testimony to a lost and to a dying world. Thank you for the good music we've already heard, and I pray that you'll use this message for your glory. I pray if there's somebody here not saved today, they'll trust the finished work of Jesus Christ as their only hope for heaven, and we'll thank you for it and give you the glory, for it's in Christ's name we pray, and amen. Now, The title of my message this morning is Evangelize for Such a Time as This. As you know from from January 4th, basically the kickoff to our new year and our vision night, our theme has been for such a time as this. And every Sunday morning that I've preached, I've stayed on that theme on a myriad of different topics. And today we're going to look at one that I think is, well, it's near and dear to my heart, but also near and dear to the heart of our Savior. 
Jesus Christ had compassion on the multitudes. He saw them as a sheep having no shepherd. And as we think about evangelism, as we think about the word evangelize, just the definition itself, Webster's Dictionary, and I encourage you, great dictionary, Webster's 1828. The dictionary definition of evangelize, if you look it up, is it, it's a transistive verb. It means to preach the gospel. That's what it says. Evangelize is to preach the gospel or to convert to Christianity. And I know this, when you think of the word evangelize, many times in, when I go this direction, I want to encourage you, don't check out. I know where he's going, he's preaching, I'm witnessing, I'm just gonna hang on to the pew just during this message, he's gonna finish and I, I, I don't wanna get out of my comfort zone, I'm not, listen, listen. First of all, we need to hear it again, amen? Second of all, second of all, I wanna take a little bit different angle today than what I normally take as we think about this topic. So listen attentively, if you would. Now I'm entering into a realm that has the potential of doing two things this topic this morning. It's very simple. Number one, it has the potential of making people feel uncomfortable. And I assure you that is not my intention. I don't want anybody to feel uncomfortable. But it also has the, I also has the potential of getting people to make a decision, uh, be encouraged to engage in what the Bible calls witnessing, evangelism planting seeds. Use whatever term you want. God's not ambiguous about the subject. We have been given our marching orders, church, and that is to go into all the world and to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't check out. I want to take a little bit different angle. Before we get into on how to evangelize, this is the different slant I want to take. As I begin to prepare this message, God began to deal with me about just getting up there, if, if you're just going to, let's just, you know, the challenge and let's soul win and let's not be ashamed of the gospel and all that's important. But God began to deal with me to say, no, 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 back up. Explain to the church why do we do what we do? What is so important about it? Why the urgency? Why is it such a grave subject? Evangelize for such a time as this. Look at Genesis 2, I had you turn there. Look at verse number seven, if you would. Here's the answer that the Lord showed me, and I think it'll be a help to you. Genesis chapter two, look closely at verse number seven. Genesis two, verse seven, the Bible says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living, what? Why? Why? Why is it so important? Why is it so serious? Why should we all engage in it? Why is it so imperative that the body of Christ collectively have a part in the distribution of the word of God? The answer, folks, listen, is found in your Bible. And that is because every man has a, every man or woman has a what? A soul. And keep this in mind, you're not your body, you are your soul. Remember that, you're not your body. Every soul lives forever. Don't lose sight of that. And if we believe the Bible, if we believe the Bible, that every man has a soul and that every soul lives forever, then you see the urgency you see the importance, you see the gravity of what we're talking about. God forbid that, that we get saved and, and we say, praise God, hallelujah, praise his name, and we've got the cure to the greatest diagnosis uh, of any mankind, and that's that all of sin and come short of the glory of God. God forbid we stick it in our pocket and we go like this and we take our light and we hide it. We sing about letting our light shine. So, Having said that, every man has a soul. Every woman has a soul. 
and every soul lives forever. Luke chapter 16, I want to give you a thought here. I don't have time to turn there in this particular one, but listen, you can turn there if you want. I'm just going to kind of paraphrase the, the passage. You have a certain rich man, the Bible says died, okay? And you have Lazarus in that context there. And, and the Bible says that Lazarus laid at the gates and was full of sores, and the dogs came and licked his sores. And the Bible says the rich man died... And the Bible says he went to hell. This is my point. The Bible says about that rich man, says he lifted up his eyes and he said, Father Abraham, dip the tip of thy finger and put it in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this what? Flame. You say, preacher, what is your point? My point is that every man has a soul Every soul lives forever, and Luke 16 makes it crystal clear, and don't miss this, that here's a man, and the Bible says died and went to hell, that was conscious. And think about this, he wanted water to be put on his what? Do you understand, you're not your body, you're your soul? So he still had the lining of his body, it wasn't his flesh, it was his soul. So he said, dip the tip of thy finger and put it in water and put it on my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. The, it's clear the rich man died and was still conscious. He had a soul. And don't let some Bible correcting scholar tell you, well, the Hebrew word for grave is Sheol. And so therefore, when you die, you just go to the grave. I was witnessing to a guy at his door yesterday. Matter of fact, the last door I was at, he said to me, when we die, we die, and that's all. There's nothing after that. Okay, so let me digress. Think, think for just a minute. If that is true, that we die and there's nothing after that, let me ask you this question, and you need to be honest with yourself. Why are you here? Why are you in church? What are you here for? I mean, it's a beautiful day. Global warming is here. <laughs> Why are you here? Second of all, you say, somebody says, well, I, I, I'm saved, but I don't believe in hell. What are you saved from? <laughs> so I'm trying to establish something that I don't even really like talking about, to be honest with you. But it is true. And, and listen, folks, it's heavy. This is a sober message. I'll try to add levity to it, but it's very sober. Every man has a soul. Every soul lives forever. And so we have to keep that in mind. Thirdly, why is it so imperative that the body of Christ collectively have a part in the distribution of the word of God? And that is because we have the answer for the lost. John chapter 6, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. John chapter 6, the Bible says crystal clear, he says, he that cometh to me, I will in no wise, what? Cast out. So we have the answer. We have the answer. May I say he's the only answer? May I be so bold in saying that? I heard recently about a Muslim man that got saved. And somebody asked him, why did you convert to Christianity? And he said, to be honest with you, I had come to a point in my life where I didn't really know what to do. And I was struggling with some things and in my life it was kind of like there was a Y in the road and, and on this side there was a dead prophet and on this side there was a living savior. And I chose the living savior. He is the way, he is the truth and he is the life. Regardless of what others say, Ted Turner, who was the founder of CNN, uh, said in, a, in an interview, he said about Christianity, he recalled it a, a religion for losers. That's what he said. You can Google it, not now, put your phones away, but you can check it out. That's what he called it. And many of uh, uh, Hollywood's crowd would do that and make their, their crowd, listen, I don't care what other people say. He is my savior. Amen. He's my Lord. He's my God. He's my redeemer. He's my rock. He's my refuge. He's my everything. He's my friend. Amen. I serve a risen savior. He's in the world today. Amen. Amen. I know that he's with me. Whatever men may say, I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. 
and just the time I need him is always near. I think of Matthew 16 and Jesus says to Peter, he says, Peter, who do men say that I am? And then he says to Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter looked at Jesus and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. May I submit to you that's the right answer. So, now that we've dealt with the why it's so important, let's look at the who. Who is to go? We've already established the Lord gave the word and we understand that the word is the seed. And now we need to look at who is to distribute the word. And may I say even evangelize. You know the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 20 it says this. We are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador is a representative of another. You hear about the ambassador, somebody says, I'm gonna be the ambassador to London, the ambassador to Japan, thank you, wherever, you name it, and that's fine. Listen, I have the greatest calling on the face of the planet. I represent glory. My citizenship is in heaven from whence we look for the Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ, who's gonna come back and he's gonna change my vile body onto like his glorious body, amen. So we are ambassadors. So the who is us. And may I say this, the who is not the one sitting next to you or the one that should have been here for this message. It's you. If you name the name of Christ, it's you. We are ambassadors and we're to do our part in the distribution of getting the word of God out. And I know there's many ways to do it. I understand that. I'm very cognizant of it. But God still ex expects his people to take his message to a lost world so they might hear the wonderful words of life. We need to ask ourselves the question, has the great commission become the great omission in our lives? It's a legitimate question. It's a legitimate question. In spite of the conditions around us, in spite of the difficulties and dangers, in spite of every excuse we offer, the Great Commission still stands. This is one way. There's other ways, but this is one way. Taking the seed of the Word of God and getting it out. The Lord gave the Word, and great was the company of those that published it. While many churches have pulled the covers of complacency and apathy and have fallen into a deep slumber of self-satisfaction and comfort, and meanwhile the world has continued its headlong plunge towards hell. Truth. I told you it's a sober message, but I'm saying it with as much grace as I possibly can. I was reading recently, and I think about that church in, in Revelation chapter three. The church of Laodicea, God said about them, he said, they said, well, we're increased with goods and we are in need of nothing. Do you know what his response to that was? He said, actually what you are is you're poor and you're miserable and you're blind and you're naked. That's what he said. That's what he said. They thought they had everything. He said, no, you have nothing because they were increased with goods and as the church falls asleep at the wheel, when we have the gospel, God forbid that at least Open Door Baptist Church ever stops lifting up their eyes and looking on the fields because they are white already unto harvest. How are we to do it? Acts chapter 20 says this, Paul said this, I went house to house warning people night and day. House to house. Now, as you think about going house to house, I don't care. Some people say, well, that's what the Mormons do. I don't care what they do. My God is bigger than anything that anybody else does. I'll even wear a white shirt and ride a bicycle if I have to. I don't care. The gospel is the power. I'm not gonna kowtow because somebody else impersonate something that's real and what's real is not the Baptist church or you know what I think is it's the Lord Jesus Christ and his word 
We're going to take the word of God to our community because every man has a soul and every soul lives forever and we've been commanded to. And because we're thankful that somebody told us. Wouldn't it be a great thing to be able to go to heaven and to be able to say to the, about the people that lived in your community and the people that you rubbed shoulders with and the people that you worked next to that you were able to give them the word of God? That you were able to plant some seeds in their lives? Won't that be a great thing? And I'll tell you what, listen, listen, listen. It all starts with a seed. It all starts with a seed. I want to show you something here as we kind of wind this up a little bit. I want you to look at Matthew 13 and 1 Corinthians 3. Matthew 13, 1 Corinthians 3. This will take me about five minutes or so, but I just want to show you something. And uh, this will illustrate a point that I think will be a help to you. Matthew 13, and look at verse number... Three. Matthew 13, look at verse 3. And look at the end, actually, the end of verse 3. Yeah. Notice this. The Bible says this. A sower went forth to what? And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside. And the fowls came and devoured them up. And, and it goes on to talk about the different soils. I don't have time to get into that. I want you to notice verse eight. But other fell into good what? And brought forth fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. So up here, as you'll notice, I have a, uh, I have a little small pot. And in this has some soil. And I'm gonna take the seed. What does a farmer do with the seed? He plants it. I know when my wife had a garden in our backyard, my job was to turn the garden. I never liked turning the garden. And, and especially if, uh, if I noticed what the apparent fruit trees did in the front of our yard, I thought this isn't gonna yield anything because they never bore any substantive fruit. And that's been a point of contention between us. So you pray for me, I'll pray for you, okay? So here's the seed and a sower went forth to sow. And you take the seed and you plant it. Now, do you understand when you plant the seed, that's all you can do? The, the type of soil you're plant, planting the seed in has nothing to do with you. Now, a whole separate message is what kind of soil you brought in here today. Okay, your heart. For example, I'm preaching the word, which is the seed, and I'm giving it out, and it's falling on soil. That soil is your heart. Some of it is falling on good ground because your heart has been cultivated and, and the fallow ground is broken up and God is able to take the engrafted word and do something in your heart today because you have good soil. But some of you brought in your hearts maybe not prepared. And the Bible says the cares of this world are just gonna choke the word. So you're not even gonna be able to uh, be a doer of the word because the soil wasn't right. Did you pray before you got in and say, God, speak to me today? That's your own heart. But this is the seed that you're planting, the seed of the word of God. The sower went forth to sow, and he just sowed the seed. Your neighbors, your coworkers, as we think about real hope, your zip code, you're just gonna be planting some seeds. I want you to look at the other reference, and this will illustrate the point. 1 Corinthians 13, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 3, here it is. How many of you are already there? Say amen. amen. Look at, look at, don't miss this. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 3, look at verse 6. I have what? So this is Paul. Paul said, I have planted, and Apollos did what? Look up here for just a minute. So, you plant the seed. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. You'd have to be inquisitive. Paul says, I've planted. And then the Bible says in verse number six, Apollos did what? So he watered the seed, right? You say, well, how do I water the seed? That's through your prayer. That's through your testimony. That's through letting people see Jesus Christ in you 
And that seed, they, somebody told him, you know, God loves you, Christ died for you. There was the seed planted. Two years later, that seed is still there. And somebody comes up to him and says, you know what, I know your family is going through a tough time. Could I bring you a meal? And they bring him a meal. You say, well, what does that have to do with the seed? No, that seed's now being watered because the love of Christ is being seen. And sometimes it's much more seen than heard. I, I, I do believe in lifestyle evangelism in addition to proclaiming the gospel. So if you remember there in Matthew 13, he says, once that engrafted word, the seed is given, some of it brought forth 30-fold. And guess what happens, folks? It begins to grow. It begins to grow, and then it's cultivated a little bit, and through prayer, and then through the engrafted word getting in, the seed getting in, and more water getting in, that person begins to grow, and eventually some 30, some 60, and some what? A hundredfold. You know, I love what Pastor Michael said when he was here. He said, you know what? You don't need to win them all. You just need to win a Saul. I, that hasn't left my mind. Think about that. One person, Saul got saved in Acts 9. One person. Think about, you take uh, Islam for an example. We know if you've studied the Quran, and I have, and I've done a series on it, and I'm not uh, gonna get into that today, but it's not about, well, there's 1.2 billion you don't got to win them all. You just got to win a Saul. You don't know what can happen. Plant the seed. My last reference I want you to look at, if you would. Look at John 4. Please see this verse, and we're going to wrap it up in about five minutes. John chapter 4. Look at verse 35, please. Now in John chapter four, I want you to notice what he says in verse number 35. Jesus said to his disciples, say not yet there are four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your what? And look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Folks, I don't know about you, I don't know how else to say it, but I can tell you from my opinion and from what I observe, this world is crying out for real hope. Amen. They're crying for it. Listen, the suicide rate is skyrocketing. People that are strung out on drugs and alcohol and all these kinds of things that are going on are skyrocketing. People strung out all over the place. And I'll tell you what that is. That is because they have no hope. So to me, that says the fields are white. That means the time is short. That means they're ready to harvest. And we need to look for opportunities. And according to that, that means this. That means, like Jesus said, lifting up your eyes, that means taking your eyes off of yourself and your own little world and looking on the fields. And then you get the mind of God when you lift up your eyes. Uh, last couple weeks ago, my wife and I were in Southern California at a conference and we're sitting at a taco stand just outside and ended up meeting somebody in the community that, that lived there, just moved there. And long story short, uh, we began to engage in a conversation and I'm talking to him. And, and I knew once I started talking to this guy, I said to myself, no matter what, however this conversation goes, I at least want to let him know how to be saved. And next thing you know, I said to him, I said, well, do you believe in God? He said to me, he said, well, I believe there's, a, I know there's, I've heard there's a father and there's a son. And then he said, and I think there's a, a Holy Ghost and he's been following me around for about five days. <laughs> Those are his exact words. Amen. And I'm just like, I mean, I've heard a lot of things witnessing before, but I don't think I've ever heard that. And I said, well, I think he has been following you around and he led you to this place right here. I took about 10, 15 minutes and I showed him from the Bible how he could know for sure he's, he goes to heaven when he dies. And, he, and I looked at him, I said, would you like to trust Christ as your savior? And he said, yes, I would. He bowed his head, asked Jesus Christ to come into his heart, to be his personal savior and to save his soul. 
You say, well, well what's the point? The point is I just simply look, took, looked up from my tacos and lifted up my eyes. And I noticed there's people around me. And I have to be reminded of that. It isn't about me. It's about us lifting up our eyes and looking on the fields. It isn't about whether or not people will get saved. It's whether or not we're giving out the word. Because the gospel's the power. It is in us. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. As I close here today, I want to just ask a couple questions and we're going to conclude, maybe end a few minutes early. I'm going to have Jennifer come and she's just going to play softly as we consider these thoughts. Do you know when I preach a message like this, and I, I said, well, oh, it's a sober message. It, it really, it's a sober message. It's a true message. It's an important message. And it's one that applies to everyone that names the name of Christ. So I want to close with this thought. Will you be a part of this great company? You say, what great company? I'm not sure what you're talking about. The Bible says the Lord gave the word and great was the company of those that published it. My question is, is pointed to you today. Will you be a part of that great company? Not will you pray about it for another year, but will you be a part of it? You say, preacher, well, how, how do I, okay, okay, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. How do you be a part of it? Well, you heard Brother Andrew mention the, a meeting, and all I can tell you is if you want to be a part of it, you want to engage in publishing the word and getting the gospel out, then you stay in here after this service and you let Brother PJ walk you through. How can I, and, and keep this in mind, so, well, it's just to build the church. No, actually, we're going to do it in the zip codes where you live, Arlington, Snohomish, Seattle, Renton. We got people that drive all over that come here. We want you to go to your community. Well, what if they don't come to Open Door? I want them to get saved. I want you to do your part in getting the gospel out. So you can say, I've given out the gospel. The rest is up to you. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So my question to you today is, will you be a part of this great company? Psalm 125 verse 6 says, He that goeth forth weeping and bearing precious seed, 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 shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Will you be a part? I mean, the answer is yes or no. We won't put you with anybody that, that uh, isn't seasoned, if you're new at it. But will you be a part? We're not handing out Shakespeare. Amen. That can't save a soul. We're handing out the Word of God. There's 10,000 that sit here on this stage. This will be the last Sunday they're here. There's close to 100 people already that have decided I'm going to be a part of that. And I'm just this is the message the Lord laid on my heart. Challenge the church one last time before we kick off Real Hope. Yes, there's projects and we're going to help the widows and the police department and the fire department. Yes, we're doing that. That is part of Real Hope. But one of, that, one of these parts is 10,000 John and Romans in our respective zip codes and where we live. Being a part of it. Distributing. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company that published it. 42 years ago, a dear lady in this church gave the word. She gave the word to my mom 42 and a half years ago, to be precise. Just on one day, when God is working on the heart of a, of a planter, and then my, my mom comes across her path. And I think back of that day, Brother Seaman, I think, what if she took the day off that day? What if she didn't take the seed and give that to my mom? My whole family got saved. 
as a result of that? Because of one faithful planter. I look out here and I see the head family. I see a whole slew of them. You know, Pastor Blue was a, in the planting business. When I look at the, the head family right now, I see Keith, I see Curtis, I see Andrew, I see their families. Here today, 45 years later, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. That dear lady that witnessed to my mom, that planted that seed, that was Jean Wake's daughter, the very first member of this church, the very first lady that ever graced the doors of Open Door Baptist Church, very first person. Her daughter led my mom to Christ. And now I sit here 45 years later pastoring this church you don't think God knew that? And how that tied together? You say, what if I'm nervous? You know, what if I don't have the time? It's not a matter, matter of if you have the time. I don't think, we, it's kind of like missions. I can't afford to give the missions. You can't afford not to give the missions. So I'm asking this church today, as I did in the 915 or, excuse me, 945 service, challenged. In just a minute, we're going to give an invitation, and this is the invitation. Number one, Lord, I want to be a part of the planting business. I want to evangelize for such a time as this. Volatile world, all kinds of unrest all kinds of things going on in this world. Listen, for the Christian, there's no such thing as unrest. If they, you know, they come in black helicopters and they're gonna get you. Okay, don't threaten me with heaven. I'm right here. See you later. You have nothing to fear. Glory, amen. There's all, we live in a volatile world, I understand that. But you're alive. You're alive for such a time as this. And God has put you where you are for a reason. And in just a minute, I want you to do two things. I'd encourage you to come and number one, ask the Lord to give you the courage to be a seed planter. Number two, if you have somebody on your heart right now that you know is not saved, that you want to pray for, you want to water that seed. It's already been planted, but today you know, you know somebody not saved. How many of you know somebody who's not saved? Why don't you take today? That's why I ended early. Take today. Bring their name before the throne of grace and say, God, save them. He'll hear you. So in just a minute, I'm going to let uh, the Holy Spirit deal with your own heart and I'm going to come pray and I'd like you to pray over the Bibles as well as they go out. We're going to open these boxes today. And we're going to get them out in this community and in our respective communities. So maybe pray for a loved one. Pray for courage for yourself. Or pray for the Bibles as they go forth. We're not going to stand. We're not going to sing a song. I'm just going to have Jennifer continue to play. And I'm going to pray. And if you want to join me, you can. And then we're going to conclude the service.